The next video in this little series I'm doing on market failures is uh, public goods. And uh, I suppose the first and most important thing really to, to get across in this video is that there is a big difference between a public good and a publicly provided good. So a public good, a true public good, um, is a very specific economic concept and it's based on the nature of the good itself. So whether a good or is officially a public good or not in economic sense is based on the good itself, as we shall see. A publicly provided good is any product which is provided by the state. So it's based on the provision of the good. Um, and that's a really important distinction. There's so many candidates that I see who talk about um, uh, a public good when they're talking about, um, you know, something like healthcare or education or something like that. And, and that's that's not correct. Um, so you need to be really careful with the difference between a public good, which is based on the good itself, and a publicly provided good, which is any product which is provided by the state. Now, to think about uh, public goods properly, we really need to consider two concepts and how they relate to one another. And these two really important concepts are non-excludability and non-rivalry. So let's just uh, consider what each of those means. Non-excludability means that a provider cannot stop non-payers consuming. So the organisation, the, the business or whatever, that, that provides this particular good, they, they don't have any way of, uh, of excluding non-payers, of preventing them from benefiting from the product. Non-rivalry means that the consumption by one does not reduce availability for others. So what that means is that by one consumer deciding to, uh, to consume this particular product, that doesn't in any way reduce the amount which is, uh, which is left for, uh, for other people. Now the really important thing to think about with a public good is that it must demonstrate both of these characteristics. So for a product to be a true public good um, in an economic sense, it must exist in this space. It must demonstrate the characteristics of non-excludability and non-rivalry. Um, if it doesn't demonstrate both of those characteristics perfectly, then we can't call it a public good. So um, what I'm going to do now is go through a few different examples and we can think about how they relate to excludability and rivalry. So what we'll do is we'll move this up here and then we will start to consider our various products. So the first thing we're going to consider is um, a cup of coffee. Um, and when we think about this, again, let's think about excludability and rivalry. So um, if we think about a coffee provider, let's say Starbucks or Costa or something like that, um, do they have a way of stopping a non-payer from uh, benefiting from their products? Well, yes, they clearly do, because they just they, they won't give a cup of coffee to you until you have paid for it. So what that means is that there is excludability. So a cup of coffee does have excludability. Is there rivalry? Well, there is also rivalry because if I consume a cup of coffee and the resources which are contained within it, like the coffee and the milk and so on, then that means that I am reducing the amount of coffee which is available. I'm reducing the amount of milk which is available. So my consumption of it does diminish the amount which is available for others. So what that means is that our cup of coffee has excludability and it has rivalry. So this product then must exist outside of, uh, of these circles entirely, and this uh, area outside of both of these circles is a private good. So a cup of coffee is a private good. It is excludable and rival. So we can put that over here. Let's think about another. Next product we'll think about then is, uh, is a Netflix service. So let's go through it again. Um, does Netflix have a way to prevent non-payers from consuming it? Yes, they do, because you have a subscription, and if you don't pay for your subscription, then they will cease your access. So Netflix does have excludability. But what's slightly different here is 
that if I'm watching a film on Netflix, that doesn't diminish the amount that are available for others. It's a streamed service. So um, my consumption of it doesn't in any way diminish uh, the, the amount of, um, of views available for others. So a, a, a product like Netflix um, has non-rivalry, but is excludable. So this sort of a product we would place in this circle. So we can't refer to Netflix as a public good because it doesn't have both characteristics, but it does have non-rivalry. So next example we'll think about then is, uh, is fishing. So um, does, is there any way that we can prevent non-payers from fishing? Um, no, there isn't. You know, the, the, the seas, or at least the, the seas, once you get past, uh, out into international waters, um, are, are unrestricted. So there's no, uh, there's no way that, that non-payers could be prevented from, from doing it. So fishing, uh, the, the, the seas, I suppose, and the fish within the seas um, do have uh, non-excludability. Um, but there is rivalry. If, uh, if you know, this, this trawler here is, is obviously catching all of these fish, the fact that they're caught by this trawler means that they are no longer available to be caught by any other trawler. So there is rivalry. So uh, products like fishing, they live in this circle over here. So they do have uh, rivalry, but they don't have excludability. Now this picture is of the uh, the Thames Barrage, which is uh, is the flood defence system for London. Um, now, if you live in London, um, then there is no way that uh, that the the people that, that put the, the Thames barrier there can stop you from benefiting from it, um, because if it if it's protecting if it's protecting all of London, then it's protecting you as well. Um, similarly, if you are protected by the flood barrier, that doesn't in any way make anyone else less protected by that same flood barrier. So all the people in London are protected equally by the flood barrier. So flood defences um, are an example of a pure public good, and they belong in the the space. Uh, the, the, the space here that, uh, that relates to pure public goods. And another example of a product which uh, exists in this space is street lighting. So uh, once the street lights are there, um, the, the, the providers of the street lighting don't have any way of preventing you from actually benefiting from that, that lighting. If you are on the street, you are going to benefit. And similarly, uh, the fact that I am benefiting from uh, the street lights doesn't reduce in any way the benefit that, that, uh, that other people can receive. So street lighting is also a public good and belongs in that, uh, in that central space there. Um, a, a slight aside here, just uh, thinking about the, uh, this, this, this section over here. So these are um, goods which uh, demonstrate rivalry but, uh, but not excludability. Um, these lead to a concept called the tragedy of the commons, which um, has, is a long recognised principle in economics and, uh, and it suggests that when there is uh, no specific ownership over over something, um, i.e., it's held in common ownership. Then people will overconsume, um, and and they will they they will not consider um, the the fact that their consumption of it reduces the consumption for others. Um, this was recognised many many years ago with um, with grazing uh, sheep on on shared land. Um, it causes a problem because it generates what we call a free rider problem. Um, so the free rider problem means that uh, that because you can't stop people from benefiting from it, then non-payers will, uh, will will benefit from a free ride essentially that uh, that other people have paid for. So we've considered the fact that we have uh, private goods, which are things like cups of coffee, which are excludable and rival. We have public goods, which are. Uh, non-rival and non-excludable, and then we have some products which demonstrate one characteristic but not the other, um, and we refer to these ones as quasi-public goods, or sort of half-public goods, essentially. So they demonstrate some of the characteristics, but not all of them. Um, so quasi-public goods exist in this space. Um, what we would also see in uh, this space as well are goods which uh, demonstrate both characteristics, but only up to a certain point. So uh, an example of this would be, uh, be roads or, or public beaches or something like that, perhaps, where um, they are non-rival and the 
consumption of one person doesn't reduce the amount available to another um, until that level of consumption reaches a particular point where it starts to become overcrowded. So th these sorts of goods where they are non-rival up to the point where they become overcrowded would also be considered uh, quasi-public goods. So all goods we can put into one of these three camps. Either they are private, in which case they are excludable and rival, they are public, in which case they are non-excludable and non-rival, or they are quasi-public, which means they are one or the other, um, or they are both, but only up to a certain point. The last thing we need to think about then really with public goods is what they mean in terms of markets and why they fail. So this causes market failure because when we think about the provision of these services, the fact that they are non-rival and non-excludable means that it is impossible for a firm to charge for their use. Um, and obviously if it's impossible for the firm to charge, then that means there's no way that they can make a profit. And if there's no profit, then there will be no incentive. And if there is no incentive, then there will be no provision. Um, so if we left public goods to uh, the free market, these goods would not be provided um, for, for, for the reasons that you can see on the screen there. So what that means is that if a public good is to be provided, it must be done so by uh, the government. Um, and the way that they get around the, uh, the free rider problem is that these products would be provided by the state and paid for through tax. Now, the important aspect of paying for them through tax means that you get around the problem of excludability because people are paying for them um, through their tax and therefore they don't have the choice about whether they pay or not. So that enables the government to get around the, um, the, the free rider problem. Um, of course, it doesn't necessarily mean that all goods you consider public goods would be provided by the state. What the government then has to do is weigh up the benefits of the provision of that good uh, with the costs of doing so and with the opportunity costs of doing so. So what else that, that money could be spent on. Um, and if the benefits that the provision of the, the public good would provide are greater than uh, the cost and opportunity cost of providing them, then this product should be provided. Any other products which are provided by the state, I mentioned before healthcare and education. Now these are clearly not public goods. The, the fact that you have uh, you know, independent private schools and the fact that you have private healthcare proves that these are not public goods. Um, so the reasoning for the government providing these is different. The reason the government provides products like that, what we call merit goods, is on a, on a, a social basis. They feel that those things are too important uh, and that, uh, that everybody has a right to, uh, to access them. But for a pure public good like the sort that we've seen here, the only way that will be provided is if the state does so and pays for it through tax.